We are gathered here to acknowledge the death of our friend and colleague, Mircea Eliade. And in this acknowledgement, remember, regard, respect, and honor the life and work of one who symbolized the excellence of the human mode of being. He told us that his name, Eliade, was from the Greek, Helios, meaning the sun, and that Mircea was derivative from the Slavic root, Mir, meaning peace, but also world and cosmos. In that name was his destiny. A great light has departed this world. Mircea is no longer with us, but for those here who know him well, we imagine that he is somewhere near Rishikesh, preparing to undergo yet another initiation. Mircea Eliade spent from 1928 to 1932 in India. That country proved to be the great rite of initiation for him, his whole life deeply influenced by that chapter of his existence. It was natural that he turn his attention to that country full of mysteries and mysticism, doubtlessly one of the major cradles of human religiosity. Whereas some other scholars like Albert Schweitzer took exception with the flight from history of Far Eastern mysticism, Mircea Iliadi was of another opinion regarding time. He speaks throughout his work of the terror of history, seeing in chronological time the arch enemy of that which in humanity must endure, the human soul, if you will. Characteristically, Mircea for a while thought of retiring in ashram of the Himalayas and spend his life in a monastic meditation. A sign of the integrative dynamism that pushed the man to embracing the totality of the homo was when Iliadi had started concurrently with scientific works, a career of novelist. The period of his Indian involvement would, among many other things, produce a study of the yoga immortality and liberty and the great autobiographical novel Maitre, the name of a young Indian lady Mircea fell in love with. But Mircea's destiny was not written only in the Indian constellation. Another pole in his formation was his native country, Romania. He, however, had part of his roots in the more mystical Romanian province of Moldavia. He says in his memoirs, I liked knowing that I was a descendant of a family of Moldavian yeomen. I was proud of the fact that I was only three generations removed from peasants, that although born and bred in a city, I was still so close to the soul of the country. Thus, on his return from India to Romania, Mircea was becoming more and more sensitive to another kind of mysticism permeating the Romanian soul. That persistent religiosity at the heart of Central Europe, he discovered, was perpetuating archaic myths, symbols, and rituals. Mircea had learned the Sanskrit in India with the desire to go to the roots of human language and human thinking sharing in that the mythic conviction that everything is best explainable by its origins. Now he was confronted with the archaic under a form that was different but surprisingly similar in its essence. He realized that our classical roots go back to what had been too easily dismissed as primitive religion.
Mircea Eliadi was born in 1907 in Bucharest. He, at a surprisingly young age, decided to become an erudite, no less. One is impressed with reminiscences of himself as a short-sighted adolescent, as he says, reading or rather devouring scores of books on all subjects, mineralogy, botany, zoology, entomology, musicology, philosophy, theology, psychoanalysis, history of religion, everything interested him. We are presently strolling in the early neighborhood of Mircea, including his elementary school on Mintulasa Street. During my school days in Bucharest, says Mircea, I always kept a journal. I used to write down my current discoveries, authors, facts, theories, in thin copy books, as well as conversations with friends, recriminations directed against some of my teachers, reflections relating to term papers, and later to my master's thesis. In those days, I was, of course, aware of the specific function of a personal diary, namely the possibility of saving and preserving time that is, of capturing the ineffable quality of a particular moment, the last rays of sun in an old abandoned house, the bench in that park where I suddenly discovered that I was, or was not, in love, and many others. colegi de liceu, începând încă din, la vârsta de 13 ani și colegi din aceeași clasă, nu numai de liceu. Și ca în toate clasele, elevii se împărțeau în ceea ce numeam noi pe vremea aceea. We were in the same high school since we were 13 years old and even in the same class. In high school, we were separated into groups. At first, he was not in my group, but later, when we both matured, we became very good friends. He was very shy and sensitive about jokes, and it showed physically. He often laughed nervously when trying to make a good impression. He started in school with an interest in natural science. Frequently, the girls and boys went to his small attic filled with his insect collection. His next interest was chemistry. He did all kinds of experiments. I was still in high school when we published a magazine called Vlastaro. Mircea started this magazine and almost all published material was written by him. Many of his articles reflected his interest in Indian culture, obviously even at an early age. At the end of the year, on St. Spiridon Day, the protector of our school, we had a show. I remember Mircea and Haig acting in one of Yorga's plays, Sarmala, the Friend of the People, and in Valjan's The Gordian Node. They played on the stage of the National Theater, which was destroyed in World War II. I feel he was a good actor. Not that I am a big fan of music, but Mircea was a very good pianist. Uh, 
When I was spending my holidays with my family in Bran, where we had a house, all of my friends gathered. Besides the ones that are mentioned in memories, Tigilano and others, was Iliadi himself, with whom I had spent a few vacations. Entering the University of Bucharest very young as a student, he passionately became the disciple of the influential Nionesco and engaged in a grand vision of Romania playing a decisive role in the renewal of human civilization. Concurrently, he felt more and more attached to the religious phenomenon. And then came the great illumination the great revelation. Everywhere is the sacred, and it is strikingly diverse but unified. It is so because at the core of human reality is the spiritual dimension. Man, in other words, is religious. Here is the essential foundation. Human religious experience is the bottom rock. Hence, no investigation goes deeper into the real than the study of human religions. I remember that it was an unforgettable moment and a great joy to attend the presentation of Iliadi's PhD thesis. He was, if I remember, 25 or 26 years old when this research paper was presented. Yoga, his thesis subject, was a sensation as it opened an exciting subject new in 1934-35, not only in Romania, but in Europe as well. Reading Eliade's books, the journal and his memoirs, has revealed his character to me. I'm fascinated by his uncommon working capability and his encyclopedic spirit. He knew so much. Not only for me, but for every teenager. Eliade, the student, is an example to follow. While still a student at the high school, Mircea wrote his first novels, short stories, essays. His favorite topic was mysteries and initiations. He studied yoga and wrote already about the Upanishad at the age of 23. Among the letters, the one of the Maharaja with the offer of scholarship to study in India. Even before the age of 21, Mircea Iliadi exchanged a rich correspondence with seasoned scholars in Europe and beyond. Names such as Papini, Petazzoni, Carl Jung, Taylor de Chardin, and others. Mircea Iliadi's work has been translated into 20 languages in 60 countries. He himself handled some 12 languages.
dacă iau în considerație If one would consider the 2,000 plus articles and essays which were written between 1921 and 1940, Iliadi's body of work would fill more than 100 volumes. În Portugalia, după Londra, uh, unde au, au stat sub bombardamentele... After London, where we lived under the bombs of World War II, we moved to Portugal. There, Mircea was designated as press correspondent, later, consul. My mother's death precipitated a relocation to a fishing hut in Casquillas, where the ocean waves hit the terrace. He drowned himself, shall I say, in writing, because he was really suffering from my mother's sudden absence. Among the many works he wrote at that time is the history of religions. I myself typed the manuscript. I started out typing with one finger and then continued typing other works. We arrived in Paris on Sunday, September 16, 1945, says Iliadi. Waiting for us at the station were Emile Charan and Lika Krakenara. Charan had found us a room at Hotel de l'Avenir on Rue Medem very close to the Luxembourg Gardens. The discovery of Paris was a series of unexpected delights. Not only the art museums and the parks, but also the concerts, the plays, the cafes in Montparnasse and Saint-Germain-des-Prés. I tried to take full advantage of this new freedom of which I had dreamed for years. Soon, however, I found my time preempted by urgent tasks. With melancholy, I realized that the freedom I enjoyed had been reduced to the two hours I stubbornly persisted in spending each morning in art museums, parks, or just walking the streets. Mircea Eliade, venind la Paris, a reluat contacte pe care le avea cu intelectualii francezi și și-a creat... Upon his arrival in Paris, Mircea Eliade revived his contacts with many French intellectuals and set out to meet new great thinkers. Virgil Arunca would be able to provide you with more information because he collaborated with him at the first magazine. For the intellectuals from exile and young students who arrived in Paris right after graduation in 1947-1948, Mircea Iliadi was a catalytic element. Hotel de Suede, where Mircea was living, became a central point of attraction. 
central de atracție. Mircea Eliade se impune. Mircea Iliadi was a great pioneer of a new scientific field, the history of religions. By 1939, his magazine, Zamolxi, was well known by the specialists. Iliadi's work stands apart from the French intellectuals. Among French essayists, there were no antecedents. One of the most respected and renowned figures of the French intellectual movement was Georges Bataille, with whom Iliadi became friends around the time of World War II. Right after the war, Iliadi was invited to Jean Vol's College Philosophique, where Henri Michaud, the Surrealist, and even Breton began to appreciate his work. A very well-known contemporary essayist, L'Ecclesio, recently wrote about Iliadi's work with a great enthusiasm. L'Ecclesio wrote of Iliadi's influence and how his ideas changed his own vision about life. Paul Ricoeur, a classical phenomenologue and politician, has often spoken about the profound change Iliadi's work has made on his life. The two academics taught together at the University of Chicago. Paul Ricoeur has often talked about the many changes Iliadi had on his world view. In this moment, at this time, all of the French intellectual elite are influenced by Mircea Iliadi's thinking. All my friends recognize with pride and joy that they are Iliadi's followers and that he had an enormous influence in their thinking and their philosophy of life. Iliadi's work is one of a kind. Nobody at that time had the same curiosity as his for Eastern civilizations, etc. Moreover, his style was limpid, without too much complexity, or meant for the specialist. He was writing for an intelligent public, open to these kinds of topics. In the 60s and 70s, there was a real interest for that which we might call the irrational. Iliadi incarnated that interest that could not leave a publisher indifferent. There is a text of Iliadi's that I like more than any other, for I consider it his best, namely, The Gypsy Girls. It's a marvelous, fabulous text that was also very hard to translate. But that was all right, for when the difficulty emanates from the intrinsic qualities of a text, it is with the light that one succeeds in overcoming the difficulties. Eliade claimed that he was paying no attention to style, but on the contrary, it's remarkable how good the style here is, how carefully Eliade chose each word. With this tale, one enters a fabulous universe where time goes through expansion and reduction in the same movement. This is the text I prefer over all others. To Iliadi, the image of the labyrinth is most important. We all are going astray, and we look for the center. 
I asked him somewhat naively at the end of our interview, which was also the beginning of our friendship, do you have the feeling that you've reached the center of your existence? For I have imagined that life is like a maze with a center that needs to be discovered. Eliade answered, with a deportment full of discretion, for he was a discreet man without grandiosity, without excess of eloquence. He answered this simple thing upon which I continue to reflect. Our life is made of several labyrinths, so that when we feel that we have reached one center and that we have left behind confusion, chaos, meaninglessness, etc., another labyrinth presents itself. There is not one labyrinth, but a succession of labyrinths. I believe that this idea is crucial. It makes us realize the extraordinary optimism of Iliadi, who, like many, but more than most, has known trials, perhaps also defeats, and the cruelties of life. Not only he surmounted those very dark moments, but as a true alchemist, he seized the black matter of all existence and made it something luminous. Paris was always Paris, with all of its fascination, with its abundant marks of culture, with its Musée de l'Homme and its Institute Asiatic, where Iliadi would read endlessly with its Musée de Louvre, where one can spend a lifetime and also its famous cafes. One thinks of the Café de Dumago, or the Café Flore. Well, there was also the Café La Corona, at a short distance from the Louvre, where Iliadi met the greatest ones of our times, such as Charon and Ionesco and others. On the negative side, Paris, of course, did not help Iliadi overcome the feeling of being in exile, of being misunderstood and more or less pushed around. Sometime he would express this nostalgia for his roots in the moving tale of the old man and the bureaucrat. The Iliadis then went through a very hard time. Endlessly, people would come to him to speak with him of one thing or another. He would have become the slave of his relationships. Many were interested in his person. I remember a conference at the Sorbonne where Iliadi was announced, but he was under the weather that day and could not come. Then a lady, an older woman, said, Mr. Iliadi is not coming, and she went away. She had come solely to see Iliadi. I have seen myself in the metro, the train, the bus, people, young people in particular, reading the history of religions by Mircea Iliadi. This I have seen several times. Iliadi was a temperament. This is important. One can criticize Iliadi, but what is crucial is the liveliness of his personality. It is something contagious. Even if one is not in agreement with something he says, there is always substance in it, depth, authenticity. His life's complex nature comes from that. It is something that is also disconcerting, but it doesn't matter. 
ça, la complexité de sa vie vient de là. To be entirely candid, one must recognize that many have been influenced by him in their very humanity. In short, he played a role of seducer. Every year, toward the end of May or the beginning of June, the friends of the Iliadis waited anxiously for their arrival. The reunion was always filled with pleasure and joy. We gathered together in our place and in their place, Chardoulan, with Chiran, Monica Lovinesco, Virgil Iranca, Alan Parwit, Paul Ricoeur, Domazil, and of course, Lizette, Perla, and Cybelle, Christinelle's sisters. I made my first visit to Bois Colum, Iliadi said, in the spring of 1948. But I do remember that it was then that I met Christinelle. She was blonde and blue eyed. She let her hair fall to her shoulders. That first image has never been erased from my mind. At that time, she was living with a friend in an apartment on Rue de Segur not far from the Rue Veneau. We met every evening and dined together, but what we liked best was to wander the streets between École Militaire and Sevre Babylone. We knew every bench, every bureau de tabac, every street lamp, and yet one night we lost our way. We didn't succeed in reaching Rue Segur until very late toward morning. Besides Christinelle, I felt I was rediscovering a vitality in a spiritual dimension which the history of the past few years had obscured. Those two, almost at first sight, knew in their bones that they were made for each other, that he remained with his wife and flawlessly faithful to her until his last is a great homage to her. She has survived her husband, and with an innate sense of measure and poise, she continues the presence of Mircha among us. Place Chardoulan, close to the Théâtre de l'Atelier. Mircha's study is the largest room in the flat with its library. In 1948, Mircha Eliade published the book that made him famous, Patterns in History of Religions. Mircha is invited as a visiting professor by the University of Chicago. The Iliadis sail at the end of 1956 toward America. Mircha is close to 50 years old. They stay a short time in New York at Christinelle's sister's Lizette's apartment. 
Lizette's husband, Yonel Perla, was director of the Opera of Bucharest and conductor at La Scala of Milan. I even bought his shoes and hats. I remember the first time when he never wore hats. In Paris, he would wear berets. And everybody told us, in Chicago, he absolutely must have a hat because it's cold. So I bought him a Borsellino hat, which was marvelous. In a shop in Paris, the salesman told me, but madame, this is a men's store. And I said, yes, exactly. It's for my husband. I even had his head size. Well, and then we went to New York. The first time we come to the United States, the ship stopped at New York, and we visited my brother-in-law, Yonel Perla. And of course, Mircha forgot his hat there. I phoned my sister and told her, be careful, don't lose the hat or lend it to anybody. Oh, I've already given it to the doorman, she said. Chicago has just celebrated its 100th anniversary. It's a young university. It was founded 1891-92. <clears throat> the first classes were 1892. Actually, it started in 91. It's one of the youngest universities in the United States, and yet outside of Harvard University, it has had more Nobel Prize winners than any university in America. Well, among uh, the many Nobel Prize winners, probably the first one in physics, a man by the name of Michelson, I think he was the first American uh, to win a Nobel in physics. And in recent years, they've had a string of Nobel Prize winners in economics, uh, I think four or five in a row. In fact, it's starting to be a joke that Chicago holds a monopoly on, on uh, the Nobel Prizes in that area, but a number of people in, in medicine, in physics, in literature, uh, Saul Bellow, a great friend of Mircea Eliade's and colleague, uh, was Nobel Prize winner in literature. But enough of that. I, I use that only as an example that for a very young university, uh, it immediately made an impact in American higher education. It is at this university where the first atomic chain reaction in the history of humanity occurred. Uh, it's been a research university. It's an upside down institution. From one year duration, the contract with the university became a lifelong covenant. Starts then for Mircea Iliadi the most fascinating chapter of his academic life. The place has found its right man, and the man his right place. There was a point reached. This story speaks both about Mircea as a human and also his role in the university and the university's impact on him. We almost lost Eliade. When he was brought over, they gave him the wrong visa, which meant he would have to return or stay out of the United States for three solid years before he could return and receive a proper visa. We could have lost him. I think if he and Christine had had to leave, for two years, I'm not so sure they would have come back. 
And at that time, John Neff, who was the uh, head and founder of the Committee on Social Thought, uh, was a very dear friend of a trustee of the university uh, who was the assistant secretary of war uh, in the Eisenhower administration, Jim Douglas. And uh, Neff got to Douglas and said, please help us. You know they had to get a special bill through Congress signed by the President of the United States indicating that Mircea Eliade was a person that the United States required to stay here for our own security and future. Well, you know that bill was meant for scientists. Now, to do this, it all had to be cleared in Washington through the Department of, of Defense. And in the middle of all this, a woman calls me, says, Dean Brower, I have been working on the case of Mircea Eliade, who is to come up as somebody required for the security of the United States. I must tell you, I became so interested in his case, I've started to read his books. And of all the people I've helped to bring in this nation for our security, I think this man is the most important of all because he is the one who really deals with our security, not through weapons, but through the ideas of what it means to be a human, and that's what the United States ought to be all about. And, of course, the bill was passed. Uh, Mircea Eliade stayed, and this was his home. What I knew uh, about him, or what I had been told about him, uh, was that he was the uh, outstanding scholar in the world, uh, on, the, on the subject of mysticism and religion. And that means that we go back uh, to some period in the 1950s. Um, he um, came to the University of Chicago to give a Haskell lecture in uh, 1956. But we knew about him before that, and we were very anxious to, to uh, uh, meet with him, uh, have him come to the university to lecture, uh, because uh, this university has a, a kind of unique divinity school which goes across all of the religions. And it is also a university which uh, has a close relationship between all the separate parts of the whole. Our view of uh, Mircea was that his interest in religion and mysticism was in part because he thought it was the key to human nature and key to all of the sciences. That those patterns were very important and um, they could be examined scientifically and, and at the same time uh, religiously. Well, he seemed to fulfill all that we wanted and more. Uh, I did not realize, for example, that um, in getting uh, Eliadia as a professor, we were adding to the talented uh, people, scholars in, uh, in the university, uh, who were great novelists, like Sal Bellow. And um, so we, there were, immediately we saw there were so many places in, uh, in the university, in addition to the Divinity School, uh, where his voice uh, would be um, uh, very important. Um, and uh, particularly the Committee on Social Thought, which I was on too, so that he immediately had all kinds of relationships, uh, uh, people from abroad that were here, but also all the, uh, the, the different professors who were here. Well, I came to Chicago 30 years ago. This is, I think, my 30th year. I came in 1962. 
And of course, I had heard of uh, Mircea Eliade. He was already a very famous scholar. And I had read one or two of his books. I think I had read his book on history. And I was very interested in the distinction between historical time and ar archaic time. And uh, uh, he made quite an impression on me. Uh, so of course, uh, I was pleased uh, at, to have an opportunity to meet him. And uh, uh, I, there was nothing I could do to prepare myself. I was m making a move here to Chicago in order to become a member of this, this faculty to which he belonged. So I began to, uh, to meet him socially uh, at various parties, because he was a very sociable person and very generous with his time uh, to a newcomer. He, we were always welcome in his house. My first impression of him was that he was a very gentle person. He was mild, and by, uh, he, had a, he had a very mild temper, and he was extremely gentle. And uh, no matter what you said to him, even if it was something stupid, he seemed to be thinking it over and taking it quite seriously. <laughs> he was always prepared to make allowances for, uh, for one's limitations. And he didn't expect you, he expected nothing from you. He made no demands on you when you met him, if you began to talk. Of course, my uh, way as a novelist is always to get other, pe to get other people to talk and uh, induce them, you know, draw them out, and so on. And it, this was very easy with Mircea, because he was, ex he was uh, always very willing to share his ideas. I think that to exclude uh, spirituality from human life is, def is deforming, is crippling for human beings. Uh, I think that Mircea understa understood that very well. And uh, we would often talk about that with, uh, in, rega in regard to Dostoevsky, to Dostoevsky's insistence, or Tolstoy's as well, that without a spiritual life there was nothing like human normalcy. You couldn't cut this away from people and expect them um, not to show the effects. Um, in the form of personal disorders, uh, uh, neuroses, psychoses, criminal impulses, or just distortions of character. Uh, and I think that's a very serious matter. I think that Mircea was very well aware of the harmful effects of the 100% materialistic outlook of the West. And he was on his guard against it. And he thought of it as a great source of harm to the young. And insofar as his young associates picked them up, he was picked it up. He was doing them nothing but good. Some of the ideas that he made available were not really his own, nor did he claim them. In a way, his work with Jung and the work that he did on archetypes, he made Jung's ideas more acceptable than Jung did. So in a sense, a great deal of what people now think of as Jungian really is Eliadian. That is to say, his ideas about the universality of certain symbols, um, he, he expressed, he refined some of Jung's ideas and uh, made them more sensible. He did not take on, for instance, Jung's idea of the collective unconscious, that we have something in our brain that has these symbols. Eliade never had much use for that. So he took the archetypes and he made them more reasonable, I think. So that was, in, that was one thing for which he's known. Of his own ideas, I suppose, an idea which again depends in part on Rudolf Otto and Das Heilige, his idea of the presence of the sacred. Um, he made that, again, much more comprehensible than Rudolf Otto had ever made it. And he showed us examples of it all over the world, where Otto had merely theoretically stated his ideas that the sacred is everywhere, and you either believed them or you didn't. And Mircea said, well, yes, and look. And he saw it in places that no one had ever seen, both very commonplace and ordinary places, as well as obviously in the great cities of the world. So he took this idea of the way that the holy, the sacred, pervades life, which, as I say, is an old idea. But he made it real because of something he had that Jung didn't have 
and Otto didn't have either, which was an enormously detailed knowledge of all the religions that there have ever been in the world. He just carried around in his head the entire religious history of humankind. And then he was able to take these theories of Jung and Otto and, and put flesh on them because he knew so much more than they do of how religions really do express themselves in the world. Other institutions had historians of religion, at least they were called that, but they were just specialists. This one knew Japanese religion, that one knew uh, Hinduism, uh, this one knew uh, Indo-European religion. But how many were interested in the structure of the history of religion, the nature of religion? That was Nietzsche. And that's what he introduced. And this changed the whole discipline throughout the United States and throughout, perhaps throughout the world. And Eliade's students, to this day, uh, populate all the great universities in the United States, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Columbia, uh, Brown. You tick off all the greatest universities in the United States. The people in the history of religions were Nietzsche Eliade graduates. In uh, 1964, I worked on my doctoral dissertation with uh, Professor Iliadi as my chief advisor. Uh, I was afraid before I uh, began to go to see him for consultation to periodically, I was afraid that it would be difficult to talk with such a great uh, and exalted uh, scholar as he. But I found uh, things were very much otherwise. Uh, he was not at all intimidating, but he was uh, fully open and very humble and uh, very much, uh, very genuinely interested in what I was doing. Uh, he made me feel as though my work were, were very important to him and that he would like to have me do uh, the best job that I could so that he could learn from me, which seemed uh, very surprising to me at first. But as I came to know him better uh, through this year and through the years that followed, that uh, I found that this was entirely consistent with what he was at all times. Uh, he was interested in other students and in their work too, I know, and all the students that I have, uh, of his uh, with whom I have talked have said the same thing, that they found him a genuine friend and uh, that he made himself uh, open to them and uh, treated them as uh, co-workers rather than as uh, inferiors. I think this was one of the strongest uh, points of his personality. The, the book that I go back to quite a bit is, is actually the book on shamanism. Yeah, um, that's good. Which, although it's a little bit more specialized than you generally see outside of, of the academic world, he has such an enormous amount of detail um, that you can really find out a lot of information and also get his ba basic ideas so that you really see the application. Unlike, I think, sometimes in, in uh, Myth of the Eternal Return, you really see his, the application of his ideas and how he takes specific instances and puts them into his broader framework. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a book that is quite accessible. And I think that as people get uh, now, right now, are, are so interested in other, other cultures, I think that's a book that can really be read by mm -hmm. virtually anybody. And, and they can come out knowing something about Eliade's method, but also something about shamanistic religions, whether it's in mm -hmm. South America or in Siberia or, or wherever. That's a great, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful book. I'll tell you one thing I love about Eliade is uh, his creativity of mind, mm -hmm. that he was both a scholar, but he also had a fantastic imagination and managed to blend those with an incredible creativity. And uh, I was reading one example the other day from The Forge and the Crucible. I want and he talks about uh, gold, the value of gold, as even how we use gold today as being basically religious, that gold has no tool value, no utility value, nor has it ever been used as a weapon of defense. Gold as a metal has no value outside of its value in itself. And he talks about that's basically a religious term, that gold is uh, a religious idea in our culture, just as it was to uh, Egyptians who made gods of gold or uh, various other cultures. So I, th I thought that was a, a fascinating idea and a useful example of how he takes an idea like value and, and uses uh, the idea of religion to elaborate. I established in uh, 1987 
the Endowment Fund for the Late Mu'chai historian of religion and also a uh, novelist of the University of Chicago. I did that for different reasons. First, I knew uh, Mu'chai Iliad as a very good friend. And secondly, I was uh, touched by his way of thinking and inspiring the student as a source of uh, reflection on everything to the young student as well as the old student. A uh, great traveler himself, uh, Mircea Iliad always encouraged the young people to travel. It was uh, his way, the only way, in fact, he thought, for the student to uh, know other countries, other cultures, other civilizations, and other languages. Danielle, let me ask you, why did you become involved in the Iliad competition? What made you want to go through the process of filling out all the forms and going through all the tests, mm -hmm. just with the chance that you might go to France? Well, um, first of all, I just always had a real love of the French language. And I thought that the Iliad scholarship would really give me an opportunity to immerse myself in you know, the French culture and it would give me a, a tremendous opportunity to just learn the language and to become acquainted with the culture. Um, I was also really attracted to the kind of um, how many uh, different cultures mm -hmm. are, are within the you know, Francophone world. You know, and I just wanted to be able to experience that um, variety and diversity of cultures you know, from um, you know, directly mm -hmm. and immediately. What advice would you have for people either coming from France to our school, or what advice would you give to current sophomores who are going to be going to uh, the French school next year? Um, I'd have to say that my biggest advice is to be aware of the culture shock because right when you get there you're just extremely amazed at all the differences there are and just the way that people act and the way that people move and the way that they regard each other. They're very family orientated and it's it's extremely different in that and I'd have to say that you should be ready for a big change. I think every major university in America, at one time or another, came after Mircea Eliade to woo him away. And uh, the worst one was about 1965, 66. The state of New York had founded four Albert Schweitzer chairs in the humanities. And uh, Arthur, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. holds one of those to this day at the College of the City of New York. And one of these universities, I think it was NYU, came after Eliade with the Schweitzer chair. This was 1965, 66. Now in those days, professors were not paid that much. This was a $100,000 package. I think the salary was something like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, at least double what he was getting at the University of Chicago. Uh, it had unlimited travel. It had $10,000 research funds, two research assistants, freedom to appoint young professors on his own with only the president approving. When I heard that, I called Edward Levy, called Edward Levy and said, he's offered the Schweitzer chair. And Levy said, what will we do? And I said, pray. I mean, how can you meet such an offer? You cannot. And I didn't even say anything to Mircea. I was afraid to. And one day he came in to talk, as usual, about the journal and what type of subsidy we needed for it for the year. And he said, oh, by the way, Jerry, uh, perhaps you've heard I've been offered the Schweitzer chair in New York. My heart went choo. And I thought, oh. And he says, but I'm not interested. I, I couldn't believe this. And I, I said nothing. And he said, no, I, why should I go? Why should I go there? I have everything I want here at Chicago. I have tremendous students. I have my journal. Uh, Christine and I have this lovely apartment, a good library, marvelous colleagues, a great, all the books. Why should I leave? Why should I leave? And I learned the lesson right there.
At this point, the focus is on the German Iliadin Library. I remember that I heard Iliadi's name for the first time in Paris when I was visiting my friend, the writer, Chiran. Iliadi and Chiran had known each other for a long time since Romania, and then in exile in Paris. They were very good friends, but very different in their philosophical ideas. Chiran told me that Iliadi was one of the most important minds of our times, and as a publisher, to take care of him. Interestingly enough, when I came back to Frankfurt, I found on my desk the translation of Iliadi's novel, The Old Man and the Bureaucrat. I started to read it immediately, and I became very enthusiastic. I did not know Iliadi's work, hence I was unable to categorize that story, but I was fascinated. It was on the one hand a love story, a tale, but on the other hand a political story occurring during a dictatorship. This fascinated me very much. We published the novel in a classical modern collection at Sir Kemp Publishing House, and it was amazing how positive the critics immediately were. A Swiss literary critic, I will never forget, wrote, This book is not only the book of the year, it will be so for many years to come. A well-known German writer, Wolfgang Kirpen, said once about the book that it is a political novel with tricks, like in The 1001 Nights. The book was published in 1972 and is still in demand today, as it will be tomorrow. Es ist ein Buch vieler Jahre, ja, es ist ein Urbuch. Und der bedeutende deutsche Schriftsteller Wolfgang Köppen äh, erzählte oder berichtete über das Buch, es sei ein politischer Roman mit Tricks aus Tausend und einer Nacht. Ich habe das also äh, nicht äh, vergessen und äh, das Buch ist äh, 1972 bei uns erschienen und es ist ständig lieferbar und wird immer lieferbar bleiben. We live in a time that makes it difficult to have great and comprehensive social utopias. Yet man cannot live without some kind of utopia. I mean, there's something in Iliadi's work that's extremely important, namely an appeal to tolerance, an appeal to trust. Irgendeine Utopie nicht leben. Und ich meine, I read once in one of his books that for him the three prophets of suspicion are Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. Marx with his suspicion regarding the economy, Nietzsche with his monstrous will to power, and Freud with his reductionist analysis of life as banal, infantile, and sexual conflicts. All these ideas were unacceptable to Iliadi. He developed something that I would summarize in a nutshell. Trust your own myths. Myths for him were sacred stories as he shows in his book, The Sacred and the Profane. There he explains that the sacred is hidden in the profane, and this trust in sacred stories, in myths, and what they are telling us, is for me the sum of his work. In, in profan versteckt ist. Und dieses Vertrauen haben zu dem, was die heiligen Geschichten, was die Mythen erzählen, das ist für mich die Summe seines Werks. Musik 
Mircha's office at Chicago, close to his apartment on Woodlawn Avenue. Kristen L. could signal to him when he was expected to come home at mealtime. Here you see the 1987 plaque offered by Macmillan Publishing House in honor of the work of Mircha Iliadi on the Encyclopedia of Religions, which he edited. He also was granted the Cross of the Légion d'Honneur by the French government. The numerous titles he received of Dr. Honoris Causa, honored by universities from all over the world in the United States, Europe, Japan, and in Latin America, represent a special recognition. Mircea Iliadi directed the chair of the university within the faculty's divinity school. This university chair was named after him even while he was alive, an honor extremely rare in any university in the world. As a Christian, it is those two factors that made the greatest impact on me, of the relationship to the cosmos and nature as a Christian and a relationship to the other great traditions. As a philosopher, a philosopher of religion in this case, the great impact of Eliade's work was to show philosophers of religion and theologians also that the religions are not primarily a matter of beliefs or doctrines, though beliefs and doctrines are important, but there is something more primal, more important than the beliefs and doctrines, the great symbols, the great myths, the great narratives, of, the, of all the religions. And that Eliade helped philosophers like my friend Paul de Cure and myself when we taught together in hermeneutics and the speech about Eliade. He helped us to find, since he was also a philosopher himself, to find better ways of analyzing philosophically not just beliefs or doctrines or ideas in the religion, but also the myths the symbols and their philosophical significance and their theological significance. The other thing I think he helped philosophers and theologians, and maybe more broadly scholars in the humanities, or even more broadly Western persons to do, is to realize that our classical roots are not just ancient Greece or ancient Israel or the ancient Romans, but they're before that. They're the pre-classical Europe the ancient Europe that he found still alive in these great myths and in these great symbols. And in that sense, Eliade is almost unique among major thinkers of the last two centuries. Most thinkers in Germany, in France, in the United States, like Goethe, like Hegel, like Heidegger, in theology, like Rama, like Tillich, spend Nietzsche before them, spend our time arguing over which aspect of the Greeks or which aspect of ancient Judaism or which aspect of early Christianity are the important ones. Eliade, of course, did that, but he also helped us all to do something that we weren't able to do on our own, namely go before ancient Greece, classical Greece, before classical Judaism, before early Christianity, and see those peoples and those traditions as still alive now and still important now. It was Eliade, I think, more than anyone that I can think of who made that move and who helped us all to begin to think that way, because now it becomes more common to think that way. Among his books, I suspect that for a wide public, the first book I read, of course, was the famous The Myth of the Eternal Return. I've read it over and over. It's a great book. It's a book that will last. It's a book that one thinks about off and on. It's a book that helps one think about such things as what does it mean to live in time? What does it mean to be involved in ritual? What does it mean to read Proust and think of lost time? It that book, The Myth of the Eternal Return, along with The Sacred and the Profane, are the two books that I think can help any person begin to realize whether or not she or he is involved in a particular religion. That isn't the important matter. What 
Eliade can help one to understand the religious sensibility and how important it is to keep alive that sensibility, just as it's important to keep alive an aesthetic sensibility. To lose the aesthetic, to lose art, is to lose something basic in our humanity. To lose the religious sensibility, and to lose that relationship to the cosmos, to other living creatures, to our fellow human beings, to not see that dimension of life is to lose something crucial for our humanity, for our souls, for who we are as human beings in relationship to the rest of reality. And those works, the myth of the eternal return, the sacred and the profane, are the works where this great scholar who wrote very specialized works elsewhere was able, which is rare for a scholar in our century, to also take his work and turn it into a vision that any person with sensitivity could respect and read. Mircha strolled in the streets and parks of Hyde Park almost every day. He loved the light that is so beautiful in the American Midwest. He might miss you in the street, being so deeply involved in his own thoughts, but not a squirrel or a bird, an insect on the bark of a tree. As an immigrant in Chicago, Mircha was delighted with the beauty of Chicago parks, with the number of trees everywhere, with the presence of wildlife within the cosmopolitan area. He combined the academic world and the world of the country so that he, a man who was superlatively read, one of the greatest savants in the history of humanity, remained all the same in the common sphere of human existence with a message accessible to all. Mircha loved nature. He was fascinated even by the squirrels who were able to live and adapt in such a wild and big city like Chicago. In the spring, on his way to class, he counted and noticed every flower. Nature deeply affected him. He so missed the red cardinal when he didn't see it for a while. Mircha Iliadi lived and worked in this environment. As long as he kept conscious, Mircha worked and he worked hard. His hands almost paralyzed by arthritis and his mind bugged by the intuition that he had reached the final months, then days of his life, he continued to rest with time until the last minute, until the last conscious breath. No day passed without writing at least a note, long or brief, in his journal about the events of the day, as he always had done since childhood. As the Roman phrase reads, Nulla dies sine lina, not a single day without writing, if even one line. Well, the fact that, that the, the diversity had not to be looked for uh, in books, you know, but in the, in the daily life, uh, Every day, Iliad uh, met someone that um, was for him the presence of what he was speaking about, Africans and Asians and uh, uh, Tahitians <laughs> or Europeans or Americans and so forth, or Indians of, of this country. Well, that, uh, of course, was uh, the ideal uh, milieu for Iliad uh, to teach and to live in. 
the fact that he lived in uh, Hyde Park uh, says a lot. Hyde Park is a is a microcosm. Uh, already, already, this part of the city is a microcosm. Mitya Iliadi said that the sacred space is the place where communication is possible between this world and the other world, from the height or from the depths, the world of the gods or a world of the dead. And then, soon enough, the image of the three cosmic zones is imposed, generally heaven, earth, underworld. The point of intersection between the three cosmic zones, the temples or sacred city, constituted by consequence a center of the world, because it is through there that the axis of the universe, the axis mundi, passes. Mircea Iliade was indeed a thinker for all languages. He was also a great writer in French. The lines that we shall listen to are taken from his last book, Briser le toit de la maison, Breaking the Roof of the House. The roof which is at the same time the limit of our profane world and the envelope of our mortal body. On aura remarqué que ces dernières décennies sont caractérisées de façon paradoxale par la coexistence d'un pessimisme tragique, névrotique et d'un optimisme robuste presque candide. Un grand nombre de scientifiques, de sociologues et d'économistes attirent de plus en plus l'attention sur les catastrophes imminentes qui menacent notre monde. Non seulement notre type occidental de culture et d'institution, mais l'humanité en général et même la vie sur notre planète. D'autres auteurs, moins nombreux, exalte les grandes découvertes scientifiques et les conquêtes technologiques que les décennies récentes ont accomplies ou commencées. Tragiquement pessimiste ou totalement optimiste, chacune des deux tendances de pensée proclame la fin imminente de notre monde. Les deux prédictions, celle d'une apocalypse et celle d'un âge d'or, sont fondées exclusivement sur le développement spectaculaire de la science et de la technologie. Pour un historien des religions, cette apothéose de l'homo faber est particulièrement intéressante et rappelle tout un monde de rituels, de mythes et de symboles archaïques. On sait que la science et la technologie ont amorcé leur progrès ininterrompu avec la découverte de la métallurgie. Autrement dit, leur progrès a commencé quand l'homme a compris qu'il pouvait collaborer avec la nature et finalement arriver à la dominer en apprenant comment faire les choses plus vite que la nature. Or, nous sommes confrontés très tôt à l'idée que les minéraux croissent dans le ventre de la terre mère de la même façon que les embryons. La métallurgie prend ainsi un caractère obstétrique le mineur et le métallurgiste interviennent dans le déroulement d'une embryologie souterraine. Ils accélèrent le rythme de croissance des minerais. Ils collaborent à l'œuvre de la nature, l'aident à accoucher plus vite. Bref, par ces techniques, l'homme prend graduellement la place du temps. Ses travaux remplacent l'œuvre du temps. En assumant ainsi le rôle du temps, l'homme rend témoignage à la présence de la conscience en chaque chose.
wasn't the beginning of our relationship. We were walking in the street here, which is called Woodlawn. It's a street here close by. And we were two of us walking. And suddenly he said, you know, Andre, the, the, the time, the moment when the human uh, ceased to walk on his four and stood up, he was free to look up to the star. And that made the trick. That is the human. See, the human is erected and looked up to the stars. Now, Nietzsche was aware of the fact that he was looking to the star, and his fellow human beings were also looking up to the stars. And that's what created the, the collectivity, the communion between people. The sacred is everywhere. In every human, there is the religious core. In every being, in everything, there is a spark. There is, if you will, authenticity, truth to the self. There is a word that echoes the word of God. That word must be freed. It must be expressed. The self must be allowed to be the world agonizes to say its truth, and Mircea Eliari did really agonize with the world, trying with all his strength, with all his science, with all his books, all his person, to help the world give birth to its existential message. For he added, the cosmos is an uninterrupted revelation. When that extraordinary man, in the full force of the term extraordinary, died in Chicago in 1986, humanity lost one of the last universal minds. Did Mircea die at the nick of time before the crumbling down of a world become so foolish as to be so less? Or is the world after Mircea Eliari on its way to a rebirth of sorts after an initiation with much suffering? The symbols have become ambiguous. They reflect a pessimistic and an optimistic view of the world. They describe the sacred as unrecognized and choked to death, but also as buoyant, rising from its tomb and glorious and shining by the rising sun. His own death, Mircea considered as participating in the agony of the world in view of its glorious resurrection. Mm -hmm.